Friday. Welcome to the After Hours of T.C. Rustani, the podcast. I am T.C. Rustani, emanating from the palatial podcast penthouse. And I got an unbelievable episode tonight and an unbelievable guest. My longtime close personal friend, he's a professional author, the one and the only Kevin Lewis. What's going on, Kevin? Nothing yeah, much, T.C. Uh, I'm just, you know, glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm... Um, Glad to be on your show. Unbelievable. This isn't your first time on our program. You were on our television version a few years ago when you got your first publication published worldwide. I remember that. That was a fun episode. Yeah, I, it was. Uh, my short story was published in an anthology called One Night in Salem. That short story was a ghostly tour. So, it, yeah. It was. It was a haunting experience having you on the program. And uh, Kevin and I have been longtime close personal friends. I always say that to everybody that's been on the show, but it's actually true. Before Kevin became a huge, big-time international author, he was an intern on After Hours at T.C. Rastani, the TV show, many, 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 many moons ago. And you had always talked about wanting to be a horror writer and you have made that a reality i have it's taken a lot of years a lot of practice a lot of hard work but yep i have finally made that a reality i remember during the interview process for the internship here on after hours and we asked you the standard question who are your inspirations in life and the top of the list was stephen king that is true and you know what he's still an inspiration to me have, have you actually met mr king I have not. I've been in the same room with him. Oh, stalking him, I see. Uh, no, no, never like that, TC. Now, so it was back in, I want to say, 2013 when he published his novel, Dr. Sleep, which was the sequel to his, uh, what was it, his third published novel, The Shining. Right. So it continued the story of Dan Torrance, the young boy from The Shining, now as an adult. And when that book came out, I he, did a, he was doing a book tour, and he came to the Harvard Bookstore. I think he was at Memorial Hall in Harvard University. Really? So I got myself a ticket, stood in line, got in there, and actually saw him in person. Did you get an autograph? Yes, I actually received a randomly autographed copy of Dr. Sleep. Unbelievable. No, have we, no, I have not seen the sequel to The Shining. I enjoy The Shining, the Jack Nicholson, Stanley Kubrick mm -hmm. film. Now, I don't, is it rumor or is it false that he was not a fan of the adaptation of the movie from his novel, Stephen King? It's true. He was not a fan of Stanley Kubrick's version. Stanley Kubrick uh, really didn't faithfully adapt King's novel. It, it's still, you know, what Kubrick did, it's still an effective horror film. And there are, you know, certainly a lot of elements from the novel in that adaptation. But his his adaptation, Kubrick's adaptation, was not a you know like a you know like a straightforward adaptation of King's novel. So King was not a fan of that. So in 1997, he actually um, adapted, wrote the teleplay, and produced a, an ABC TV miniseries remake called Stephen King's The Shining, which, in my opinion, is that's that's my preferred. Adaptation. But yeah, but there's no Jack Nicholson in it. I know, but Stephen Weber. Like I said, there's no Jack Nicholson in it. Um, now, in in the the sequel here, I'm, we're not doing a program about you know uh, Stephen King novels, but he is your he inspiration and hero. Uh, it, does Danny still go around going red rum, red rum? Uh, not in this, no, because he never did that in the novel. Really? No. What, did now? Did Tony live in his mouth in the novel? No. So that was all made up. It was. So you think you think a lot of the stuff that Jack Nicholson did was improvised on set? He it, possibly. I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent. I'm sure of like all that went on the behind the scenes on that movie, but I think some of it might have been improvised. But uh, I know. I think they did a lot of rewrites, if I recall. But it's it. It was certainly um, quite the uh, movie version. And obviously, I'm sure. I'm sure. Here's Johnny was improvised. I don't, you know, that I can't tell. I can, I can tell that it was not in Stephen King's novel. Okay. Now, here's a little interesting thing. You know I'm a huge Star Wars fan. You are? Uh, well, that's just it's a rumor going around. <laughs> uh, you know, some of the snow that was used for The Empire Strikes Back was actually from The Shining set? I do. Well, yeah. Of course you're going to know, because you stalk Stephen King. So. Exactly. <laughs> no, I did hear that. And I think he, because I think, wasn't there like some kind of issue with the set of Hoth? They were going to film, was it, weren't they filming on the same studio Yeah, they were or over something? at the Elstree Studios in yeah. London, England. But I, I, And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure some, someone will correct me, but I think Steve, uh, Stanley Kubrick almost burnt down the, uh, the studio. Yeah, I think he did. And there was like a delay in filming The Empire Strikes Back, and as a compensation, they gave him some free snow for Hoth or something. 
I don't know. know. But, well, you know, that's a fascinating story for a different time. When you come back with Stephen King, we'll ask him these questions. Exactly. There you go. But you now you have been a professional author now since 2013, correct? Yes. Well, it actually goes back farther than that. My first story, short story published was called The Caretaker, and it was a ghost story that was published in a Halloween issue of an online uh, magazine called Blood Moon Rising Magazine. So that was my first ever published story. But and that was back in like two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Okay, but but, it, but you can we can we get that on Amazon as well? That you no, that wouldn't be available on Amazon. That was online only. I'm not sure if it's archived. So it was like a fanzine or something. Exactly. Okay. So exactly. But now, well, now we're talking about you're big time. You're on Amazon. Yes. And uh, you I know, have an author page. Huh? I have an author page. You do have an. I, I visited it. You sent me the link, and I was like, you know, showing everybody, saying, "Remember little Kevin? He was the intern down here. Look at him. He's now, you know." Chasing Stephen King down a proverbial horror hallway somewhere. Um, now, like we said, flashback going back when you were a kid. What was your first introduction to a horror novel? I think it's 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 not a novel, okay. but I think my first introduction to kind of the horror genre, or at least you know, ghost stories, was the Legend of Sleepy Hollow, and in, in in that case, it was actually the Walt Disney cartoon version. Oh, okay, and I actually had my aunt. Um, bought me when I was a little kid, and I still have it. It was the Walt Disney picture book adaptation of that, you know, short cartoon uh, that I think Bing Crosby narrated. And that was kind of like my first introduction to kind of, you know, ghost stories and, you know, all things horror. So I kind of, you know, I kind of grew up with um, kind of a love and appreciation for ghost stories. But what's interesting about my so, sort of, you know, how how, my, how I came to really appreciate horror is you know, when I was a kid, my parents would never let me, you know, watch like, you know, a horror movie. Like, you know, they would have never let me watch, you know, The Shining back when I was a kid, even though my dad was a huge fan of that movie because he was a big Jack Nicholson fan. You know, my parents wouldn't let me watch any of that stuff. You know, they wouldn't let me watch like Aliens or John Carpenter's The Thing or John Carpenter's Halloween, none of that stuff. So I really didn't, I didn't. I knew that they existed, but I never, you know, got into them. Like my my parents would have never let me read, you know, Stephen King or watch any of his stuff when I was a kid. It really wasn't until middle school that uh, one of my, you know, classmates, I think, noticed that I, you know, enjoyed reading, and he said, you know, have you ever read Stephen King? And I said, you know, no. And it's like, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I'm not going to read king he's 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 a horror writer he he writes all that like you know gory you know grisly you know spooky stuff that you know i like ghost stories but i don't like like really scary stuff so but he said like you know i think you might like him so i you know after much you know prodding and you know begging i think of my from my parents they finally let me you know read king and my first i think my first horror novel i ever read Particularly, my first Stephen King novel was Pet Cemetery. Really? Yes. <clears throat> now they just made a really bad remake of that for a movie. I actually thought that remake was decent. I, did, you know, I did, there's there's not, it's not the book. It's not Stephen King's original, you know, 1989 movie that he actually scripted. But it's it's not bad. Okay, I'll have to give it a second check yeah. because I'm, you know, even the one that came out in the the late 1980s isn't a, you know, it isn't the Godfather. Let's just put it that way. Um, but um, it's classic. Game. It, no, it is classic. I mean, <laughs> it, and of course, it takes place in Maine, like most of his stories. Do. Exactly. Um, growing up, uh, I wasn't much of a reader. I will admit that I was a poor student, but I, mean, I was an entertainer, so I really didn't. You know, it's like Rodney Dangerfield in the movie Back to School. Who has time to read? You go in, you see the movie, and you're out in two hours. You know, <laughs> basically, that was my philosophy as well. Hey. Um, it's entertaining though. Um, but now I have been, you know, I've started a few of the Stephen King books. I haven't finished them yet because they're long. They're very long. <laughs> they're very long. And, uh, and for some reason, all the movies seem to be showing up on cable now. I mean, I've seen Carrie. Now I hadn't, I saw Carrie originally back in the late 1970, early 1980s and hadn't seen it for 40 years. Mm -hmm. I don't know why people think that's a horror movie. It's more of a revenge story, in my opinion, than a horror movie. You know, it's very interesting that you bring that up. I was in a, in fact, it was it was right before you know COVID hit. Um, back. That's a that's a horror story. That's a very it's a very horror story. So I was I, I was in the audience um, at a panel on I think it was horror fiction writing. I know Paul Tremblay, uh, who's another one of my inspirations. He, he's a local horror author. He's he's amazing. He was on the panel. And they were talking about 
you know, obviously horror fiction, what constitutes, you know, horror novel, what constitutes a paranormal or a supernatural tale. And I, I, I might not, might have missed, or I might not be remembering everything, but I remember King was brought up and, you know, the debate was like, you know, is a novel like Carrie a horror story? Is Firestarter, which is also written by King and right. was made into a movie, is that a horror novel? And you know, I you know, I read Carrie. I read Carrie back when I was in high school, so it's been a, it's been quite some time. In fact, I was just watching the the original Mo- Brian De Palma movie not too uh, long ago. And then I you know, I recently read within the last couple of years. I read Firestarter finally, which, which is brilliant. And I actually kind of have to agree. I don't think um, it's not really your sort of cookie cutter kind of horror story. Both Carrie and Firestarter, particularly with Firestarter. It's because it's it's about a person about a kid with abilities. I mean, it's like you could almost like put that up there with like maybe a more horror esque version of the X, of you know X Men or Stranger Things. Exactly. I don't I don't consider Stranger Things one hundred percent horror. I think it might it has horror elements, but can you class, classify it as a true like this is a horror? Like, yeah. When, you know, I, when I, people think of horror, you think of like you know. All right, quote unquote, Friday the Thirteenth, mm-hmm. you know those slasher movies and whatnot, yeah. or Psycho, or uh, you know, in some cases even Jaws. It's funny. I have a weird, uh, you know, I. It's yeah, you can classify that as sort of horror, but sometimes I don't even classify because it's like it's again, it's not supernatural. It's a to me, it's 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 a sea, it's a sea monster or like sea kind of adventure kind of story with kind of like a killer shark. But I think in some degrees, yeah, yeah, I mean. You could probably designate it as somewhat of a horror story because there are more people around the world who are horrified going in the ocean than they are walk, talking to someone in a hockey mask. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you went down to like say Revere Beach at like <laughs> like you know seven o'clock at night when the sun is setting and you had a giant speaker and started playing the Jaws theme, people are running out of the water. <laughs> exactly. If you walk down Revere Beach with a hockey mask, they're gonna go, "Who's this imbecile?" You know. <laughs> So basically, let's see a sharp machete. <laughs> right, let's get a sharp machete. Or they just say, "Oh, it's Revere," and just keep on walking. Um, <laughs> but getting back to Carrie, like I said, I haven't seen it in forty yep. years, and you know, it was creepy in a way. You know, you know, huh. her mother was more, you know, horrifying than Carrie was. Yeah, she and she was the monster, and she, the people that tormented her were the monster. She really was not, in my opinion, she really wasn't the monster. She became kind of a monster at the end, but it's just like she just had all this pent up. Yeah, she Angry. wasted everybody, even her friends she yeah. wasted at the end of Carrie. Yeah, for, her, uh, the teacher. The teacher, yeah, the gym teacher, yeah. who was like your big number one supporter. She said, ah, screw her, she's dead too. Um, so when I was, I was watching this, I'm going, okay, I mean, I mean, getting, you know, Pet Cemetery, I would say, is a horror movie. You know, your, your, your cat dies, your buried, it comes back to life, and hey, my son gets run over. Let's bury him, and he'll come back and start wasting exactly. us too. That's scary. That's, yeah. But, um, but your stuff, now, are you mostly paranormal or are you in the you know slasher stuff? I, I'm both. I've ri- I've written mostly paranormal and you know horror and you know creature feature, um, you know the um, Blackstone um, the the Blackstone stories for Lovecraftian summonings, uh, which is curated by Raphael Pizzella. This is the newest one that I'm in. This is a sort of creature feature horror, kind of cosmic horror story because it's, you know, it, it's, you know, inspired by Lovecraftian either horrors or just the cosmic horror in general. Um, so that's, you know, that's more of a paranormal, you know, creature feature kind of tale. Um, my debut novella, The Cat Creeper, which came out last July, uh, that's um, a definite creature feature, supernatural, you know, kind of monster mash kind of a story. So that's definitely more horror esque. I have uh, written, I've written a few screenplays, and one of them is a straightforward slasher film in the vein of Scream. And like I know what you did last summer. That's not a, you know, that's there's no paranormal at all in there. So it's very much like, um, well, the original, like the original Friday the Thirteenth or the first one. Uh, which had no, you know, paranormal, or the first few really, uh, which didn't have any kind of paranormal um, aspects to it. And like, you know, again, a movie like Halloween, it's very much in that kind of nature. Um, so I've done both, but most of them have been supernatural tales. Unbelievable. Now let's give us the full one one on your latest project, Trapped on the Night Shift. Yes, I'm very excited about this sh- short story. So it came, it came out um, this past week. Uh, from Eighth Tower, um, Eighth Tower 
uh, Records is also it's a it's a a music label um, based out of Italy, uh, owned and operated by Raphael Pizzella. He is a music curator, and one of his labels is Eighth Tower Records, and that label is de- dedicated. Uh, basically to sort of dark, um, ambient kind of music, uh, you know, very much in kind of like sort of like horror-esque kind of like, you know, it would kind of put you in that kind of horror type of mood music. And how I came to this anthology was uh, a friend of mine um, who's a New England uh, horror writer um, named Richard Allen Scott. He um, he knew uh, Raphael Pizzella and he, um, you know, um, Raphael Patella was putting together this um, Lovecraftian cosmic horror anthology, and Richard Allen Scott invited a bunch of us to, uh, you know, um, if we were interested, to submit stories to them, and I did. Um, uh, some fellow um, horror writers, um, Elizabeth Black, uh, John Buja, uh, Richard Allen Scott, um, and myself uh, were all in this anthology. Uh, as well as Ramsey Campbell. He's a noted um, horror writer um, out of Britain. So he's in this uh, anthology as well. And basically this anthology is, you know, Lovecraftian, like cosmic horror stories. So some of them are based on, some of them are set in the world of H.P. Lovecraft, who was a horror writer back in the um, 20s, 30s, I think 20s and 30s. He, I'm a huge fan of H.P. Lovecraft. He's inspired a lot of horror writers over the years, including Stephen King. And um, he, his work um, has been very influential on, on horror fiction. He, you know, kind of created this um, sort of you know genre called cosmic horror, uh, which has a lot of kind of attributes to it. Um, basically, cosmic horror is about kind of like, you know, part of it is like, you know, you know, characters that who just, um, they're facing up against this, like, you know, unknown, um, something that is unknown, this like horror that is unknown. We can't define it. Uh, A lot of times the characters end up going insane. A lot of Lovecraft's characters, it's uh, very character based, but there's, there's a lot of, you know, they, they're, they're basically going up against this thing that they can't describe, that, that, they, that they can't fathom, and they a lot of them go in, you know, go insane. Um, so that's part of his kind of, um, that's part of, like, the cosmic, you know, um, horror. But there, there's many attributes to it. So a lot of these writers, you know, they yeah, some of them took, I think, uh, you know, some of them took, you know, uh, they added to kind of Lovecraft's mythos. Mine was sort of, uh, it did, it, I don't, um, I, I didn't write it um, based on any of his, um, you know, mythos. I just kind of did my own version of sort of like like my version of like a cosmic horror story. So Trapped on the Night Shift is about a janitor who is, you know, he, he's on his night shift and uh, at, at a school and he thinks it's, uh, you know, he thinks he's alone, you know, because he's supposed to be alone, you know, on the night shift. And he basically encounters these, you know, dimensional um, creatures that have broken through from their world into our world. So he's got to kind of figure out how to stop these creatures from basically getting out of the school. Just feed him some of that school lunch and he'll take off. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly what's going to happen there. <laughs> Unbelievable out there. Now, the writing process. Yeah. Now, where do you come up with your ideas? Are you like in the shower, driving down the street, driving, you know, w- you know, walking in the woods and whatnot? How do these ideas pop into your head? So it could be a, a, a bunch of things. Sometimes it just, it just kind of comes to me. I'm, I'm either looking for them. Sometimes it's a call, like a submissions call. Like if they're asking for like a particular particular topic that they're looking for like i you know we're looking for you know aquatic based horror stories i'll try you know i'll try to rack my brain of like ideas um for this, for this particular story i sort of reworked it um originally i i was well like like a lot of writers i was actually heavily influenced by stephen king so um some of his earlier writings particularly the mist this was this had um definite um inspiration um, to me, I kind of liked the idea of, you know, kind of interdimensional, you know, creatures kind of spilling into this world, which has been done. You know, a lot of writers have, have, have you know, um, have done this. Um, you know, Buffy kind of touched on this. I kind of liked, you know, but my, my take was I wanted to have this more done with like via witchcraft. 
because it's you know, if you read it a lot of it um, there's witchcraft involved which um, it, you know, is different um, than what other people have done um, kind of in the past or so that was kind of like my sort of you know um, so this is so there's basically you 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 don't know any janitors that have encountered any of this stuff you know you're just telling their story I'm telling their story yes okay so you actually knew know somebody who actually encountered it uh, so part of the story was based on I kind of put my experiences because uh, I used to um, be a janitor on the school vacations at the Merrill's Middle School right so I sort of took I I actually I actually was working on a story. Uh, and it wasn't really going anywhere. So I kind of took some of those aspects and put them into this story. So I kind of combined a couple stories together into one. Um, and I just, you know, I, I kind of came up with my own story and, uh, I used some of my, you know, my, my, you know, memories from being a janitor there. And I just kind of drew from experiences there and kind of created the character of Chuck. And he, he has this, he's this poor guy. That's on the night shift. Yeah, his family's driving him crazy. So he's like, I'm just gonna take this like shift for a while. And unbeknownst to him, he becomes, you know, um, you know, uh, basically embroiled in this, you know, this wacky world of paranormal. Yes, and creatures. Now, do any of them come out of a toilet? No, there is a toilet scene. Because in the story. janitors do clean toilets. Oh yeah, and l- l- let me say, I, I'm not going to say too much, but uh, there is a toilet scene. Okay, all right. You know, th- you know, any good horror story has to have a good toilet scene. You, you do, yeah. You know, I'm surprised it hasn't been like a, you know they've adapted you know Jason who's a crazy man wearing a hockey mask, Michael Myers who's wearing a William Shatner mask. Yeah. You know, has, has there ever been a psychopathic plumber? <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm sh- I'm sure there there uh, maybe. Maybe I will come up with that. Maybe we'll collaborate on yeah. that story. We'll call it the the crack killer. The but you know you know <laughs> plunge this. Yeah. Um. <laughs> that's, that's the tagline. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you, speaking of stupid things that have made into horror movies, have you ever seen Thanks Killing? No, I've heard of it. You haven't. I mean, for those of you who are listening out there who have never seen it, go on YouTube and type in Thanks Killing. It's basically a Thanksgiving turkey that's murdering people. And the tagline for this movie, I had to watch it three times because I was laughing so hard, was gobble, gobble, motherfucker. <laughs> Look up Thanks Killing if you're bored. <laughs> but it's like they've done it with Halloween. They've done it with Christmas. Why not Thanksgiving? Why not? I know. know. I mean, that is a an American <laughs> holiday. Exactly. I mean, I know a lot of the countries celebrate Thanksgiving, but it originated right here down the street in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Now, are we going to have a crazy turkey going around? I'm behind it because I'm from here and I support this. Exactly. I think I think I think you need to find out who owns the copyrights of that and try to adapt a huge, huge like Godfather type movie with all these crazy killers that you're going to come up with. That's totally doable. I, I, it, of course it is. They do it yeah. like with the Avengers and whatnot. Why not yeah. crazy? You know, yeah. bird killers and stuff like that. You know, you know. Alfred it, Hitchcock did it. So that's true. But the but the you know the birds weren't going around going you know. <laughs> You know, have you know, uh, you know, gobble gobble, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> no, that wasn't his style. You know, I'm sure he's rolling around in his grave somewhere, knowing that that exists out there. That he he invented the genre of bird horror, and they took it to this where some crazy muppet looking turkey is wiping out people. Unbelievable. Now the writing process. Now we we talked about how you got your ideas. Mm-hmm. Now do you sit down in front of a typewriter or a legal pad with a pen and paper? I mean, I mean, I mean, how long does it take from like a thought in your head? to being published so when I finally found kind of like the idea behind Trapped on the Night Shift uh, when I knew what I wanted to write a lot of times I will I'll I'll do both computer and notepad Uh, a lot of times my first draft I will I I, I will write like hand write the first draft particularly with a short story um, on on a notepad because sometimes like if I'm going into work you know, um, or, you know, if I'm on my lunch break, you know, I'm not at my computer, I will, like, write in the notebook. And then from there, I will transpose it to uh, the computer screen. I think with Trapped on the Night Shift, it was originally another story um, that I was trying to, that I was, uh, that I was working on, uh, that that didn't end up working out. Uh, and I, and I am pretty sure I did write at least parts of it in a notebook. And then I, you know, trans, transposed it to, the um, computer, and then from there, a lot of times I'll print it out, I'll print the story out, and then just kind of, you know, edit it from there, and then, you know, just kind of until it's until it's done. So roughly, what is it, a couple months, or? 
it, it, sometimes it could be like a, like a couple of years, depending on really? like, if I, well, you know, in terms of like you know when I write it, to, if I can get it published, if right. I can get it published. Now, how did you actually get, get your first story published? I mean, did you submit it to some contest or some online thing, or did you actually know somebody that said, hey, this is great, I know a guy? So for The Caretaker, which was my first one back in 2008, 2009, that one I submitted to a few magazines, and you know I got you know rejections, and then Blood Moon Rising came along, and they, they accepted it. So for that, you know, it took a few you know, times and w- which happens. That's that's kind of the writer kind of life. You know, it's you just you, you put yourself out there, and uh, you just wait till someone picks it up. With the cat creeper, I worked on. I started that back when I was in seventh grade, because uh, that was one. That was one of the first stories I I wrote. Or I started when I knew I wanted to be a horror writer, uh, and again, it was this was my first Stephen King kind of story. Uh, again, I was inspired by, you know, Pet Cemetery. I kind of wanted to do my own version of, like, you know, resurrecting things. So this was, like, again, this was my wacky uh, kind of, you know, version of, you know, uh, like, I'm going to uh, have my character resurrect something, and this is how I'm going to do it. Again, through witchcraft. I love using witchcraft um, to kind of, you know, um, tell some of my horror stories. Uh, and... I worked on that. I, I worked on the Cat Creeper for about twenty five years. Oh, I, really? Wow! Yeah, Labor I, of love there. Yeah, I revised it. I, I had I, I had a couple beta readers look at it. I had it professionally edited, and I sent it out, and I uh, got rejected a handful of times. And then I saw this, I saw this um, submissions call for stories that were that would that would. Um, Kind of, um, kind of inspire the uh, inspire the like the, the the reader or make the reader uh, think about all those like you know horror movie you know um, horror movies you would peruse in the video rental aisles of like the you know eighties and nineties so like you know movies like Friday the Thirteenth John Carpenter's The Thing I Creep sp- Show I spit on your grave <laughs> yeah yeah stuff like like the crazy the gore splattered. You know, uh, the good stuff. Lines. Exactly. The good stuff. Yeah. So I thought to myself, well, I think the Cat Creeper would be a good fit for that. So I submitted it and I got accepted. And the rest is history. Exactly. Now, now, like you said, you, you you're doing this not as a full time gig yet. You're not doing yet. you're doing this as a as a labor of love, and, and it's it's fascinating. It's awesome to know that you've actually made it. Yes. I mean, you know, there are a lot of people who say, you know, they, they they're going to make it, they're going to do it. You actually stuck to your guns, never stopped. And I'll never forget the phone call. It's like, hey, you know, I got a new book that I've gotten published. Can I come on the program? Yeah. And I was like, well, I knew this day was going to happen somewhere down the line, but I didn't think it was going to happen that quick. Mm. I mean, you're relative. How old are you? You're in your early thirties. Uh, late 30s. Oh, you're in your late 30s? Yeah. Well, you know, I've known you for 100 years. so you Exactly, know. yeah. All right, so you're in your late 30s. You started some of this stuff when you were a kid, and now, you know, it's paid off. It's like it's like, with, like the line from Back to the Future. You know, if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. Exactly. Perseverance. It pays off. You just got to keep at it. Now, feature films. You want to make these into feature films? I would love these to be, like, you know, feature films. I think, like, Trapped on the Night Shift would be a really cool... You know, maybe movie expanded. I could even see that as like um, being like the first section of like something bigger. Because if you if you read the story, it doesn't end there. Who, who do you, who do you have in your mind to play the janitor? Oh, I don't know. I think back in the day, I think I pictured John Travolta. Really? Yeah. Oh, have you seen his movie called The Fanatic? I have not. After you've seen that, you won't be casting John Travolta. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> he was like he was like uh, an insp- he's like a person we know a mutual friend Quincy. It was it, ah. it, it, we like him on steroids. Basically, what that was about. It's <laughs> so bad. I recommend you to watch it just to see this train wreck. Yeah, all right. It's kind of like Thanksgiving, but with Vinnie Barbarino from Welcome Back, Carter. All right. <laughs> okay, now that Travolta's out of the picture, who do you think you want to see as this character? Oh wow, I don't. That's hard because it's like there's so many good. Actors, I would probably say, I mean, probably, I'm just kind of throwing it out there, like maybe like, you know, Chris Evans. Really? Yeah. So, you know, you weren't thinking Colonel Bull Montana, my co-host, maybe? Uh, no. No? No, not at all? No. Could, I could see him in a horror movie. He's definitely, he'd, he'd definitely be in off. one of those H.P. Lovecraft psychopath movies. I could see him hanging around somewhere, yeah. you know, like this this mystic <laughs> that you need a translator to understand. Yeah, he can like, you know, help summon Cthulhu. 
So you know, he can help someone a cheeseburger too, but uh, <laughs> that's a different. See, so you know these people. Some of these people who are listening to this podcast are like, "Who are you talking about?" But you've actually broken bread with the man, right? Uh, yes. So un- unbelievable. Now, if anybody's listening out there, which we know they are, where can they track you down? How can they contact you on social media? And how can they get these fine books? So I'm on Facebook um, and Instagram, uh, Kevin Lewis. Uh, so you can uh, find me on Facebook. Uh, Amazon.com again, um, Kevin Arthur Lewis. I'm on there. Um, you know, find me and yeah, and, and read we'll, my stuff and read his stuff. I mean, it's awesome. I mean, uh, I mean, I got an autograph book that you brought down for the show down there. Yeah. I'm putting that and saving that for when you become like the next Stephen King. I'm gonna, I'm, you know, no offense, I'm gonna sell it on eBay. I'm just gonna let you that know that now. Um, <clears throat> but uh, this has been awesome. I haven't seen you in a long time. Yeah. And uh, when I when I heard about you have a brand new book out there, I said, damn it, I got to get Kevin down here in the podcast penthouse and talk a little horror. Nice. Now, before we wrap this up, horror, you, that's your genre. It is. But have you thought about doing, you know, like mystery or sci-fi or, or something totally outside of the realm of horror? I actually love sci-fi. I love mystery. Uh, I have written a paranormal murder mystery novel that I really need to, you know, work on and edit and try to get out there because it's awesome. So I've actually had that written for several years, but I kind of put it down for a little while, so I got to do that. I'm also looking to possibly edit, or I'd like to edit a um, a sort of sci-fi horror YA novella that I've been getting, been working on for a while. I'm going to hopefully get back to that maybe at some point. So I definitely am interested in other genres because I love science fiction and horror and science fiction can also cross sure. into each other, which is great, but I would love to do it like a, like a, um, I would love to do like a space opera kind of like, you know, like a, like a star Wars esque kind of space opera kind of story. I would love to do something like that. Unbelievable. Down there. Yeah. Well, no, final question. You're into the paranormal. Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen anything paranormal? I have not. You have not? I have not, but I would love to. Okay, off here, I'm going to tell you about some of the paranormal activities that I've experienced. I would love- God's honest truth. You know, All it's right. fantastic. Nice. Unbelievable. My longtime close personal friend, Kevin Lewis. Find him on Facebook. Find him on Instagram. Go to Amazon and look under Kevin Arthur Lewis, and you'll be able to find all these fantastic horror stories. Get them now, because I'm telling you, the next Stephen King. And this is After Hours of TCB Starting the Podcast, and we never close.